Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Ed Excel International A Level, Chemistry Unit 2 for January 2022. This is the part 3 video. I'll put the link to the part 1 and part 2 videos below in the description box. Let's begin with question 23. Question 23. Magnesium ethan dioate decomposes on general heating to form magnesium carbonate and carbon monoxide. Part A says state why the thermal decomposition of magnesium ethane dioxide should be carried out in a fume carbon. If you observe this reaction, carbon monoxide is produced and we know this gas is toxic, so this should be carried out in a fume carbon. The next part says, after heating a 6 gram sample of magnesium ethane dioxide for 3 minutes, the decomposition was 70%. Calculate the total mass of the solid mixture that remains. Remember, they have said 70% complete decomposition. So I began by finding the molar mass of each. Molar mass of this one is that gram per mole, and the molar mass of this is that gram per mole. I could write here gram per mole. Then next is to find the 70% decomposition. Remember the original mass was 60, so 70% decomposition is 70 over 100 times 6, which is 4.2 grams. And the mass of magnesium ethane dioate left is going to be the original 6 minus how much has decomposed, and therefore this is 1.8 grams. Now, I'm going to use the mass of what has decomposed to find the mass of magnesium carbonate that will be produced. The moles of magnesium ethane dioate could decomposed will be the mass divided by the molar mass, which gave me these moles. If we look back at the reaction equation, the ratio is 1 to 1, so the moles of this reacted are equal to the moles of that produced. So meaning the moles of magnesium carbonate produced are equal to those moles. And therefore the mass of magnesium carbonate is going to be the number of moles times molar mass, which is that times 84.3. And the answer I got was 3.1528, rounded off to 3.15 grams. So the total mass left is the undecomposed magnesium ethane dioxide plus the produced magnesium carbonate. So I added that and the answer became 4.95 grams as required. Next they say, magnesium carbonate undergoes thermal decomposition at a high temperature than magnesium ethane dioxide. So the decomposition is that. Explain the trend in thermal decomposition of group two carbonates going down the group. As we go down group two, the charge on the cations remains the same, but the sizes of the cations increase and that means the charge density on the cations is going to decrease. And then that means polarization of the anion by the cation is going to decrease. And therefore, certain bonds like the carbon oxygen bond are not going to be weakened. And therefore, more energy will be required to decompose. So in conclusion, we can say thermal stability increases. So I said down group 2, thermal stability of group 2 carbonates increases because the size of the cations increases yet the charge remains the same. So we can say the charge density on the cation decreases. So the polarizing power of the cation on the oxygen decreases. The carbon-oxygen bond is not weakened, thus more energy is required to decompose. My demonstration is here. This one has greater polarizing power and this one has lower polarizing power. So this is going to distort the electron cloud on this oxygen, weakening this bond and therefore less energy will be required to break that bond. But in barium, we see that size of the cation is bigger and the charge is still the same as magnesium. So that means the ability of barium to distort the electron cloud on oxygen is going to be lower. And that means this bond is not gonna be weakened as much. So more energy will have to be supplied to break that bond in order to decompose barium carbonate in comparison to magnesium carbonate. So this brings us to the end of question 23. Let's continue to question 24. Question 24. Some diesel cars contain an extra catalytic converter for the reduction of nitrogen oxides in exhaust gases. A solution of urea is used for this process. So this is the structure of urea. And they say urea has a melting temperature of that. Explain why this value is higher than expected for a relatively small molecule. If you look at the structure of urea, we can see there is a possibility of formation of intermolecular hydrogen bonds due to the nitrogens of one molecule and the hydrogens of another 
or oxygen and hydrogen of another. So I said urea can form into molecular hydrogen bonds between its molecules. Also, urea can form permanent dipole dipole interactions between its molecules. And these forces of attraction are stronger than just London forces. So we see even if it's smaller, there is going to be a higher melting temperature. Down here they say a saturated solution of urea has a concentration of 9.07 mol per decimeter cubed at 25 degrees. Calculate the mass of urea in 150 centimeters cubed of saturated solution. I need to first find the molar mass of urea and as you can see, this structure has one carbon, two nitrogens, four hydrogens and one oxygen. So the molecular mass is going to be calculated like that and I get 60 gram per mole. Now the moles of urea should be concentration times volume, which is the concentration 9.07 times the volume. But I divided by 1000 to convert this volume into decimeters cubed and I got this as the number of moles. That means the mass of urea should be the number of moles times the molecular mass, which gave me 81.63, and in the end is 81.6 grams to three significant figures. Moving on. Here they say, state why NOx emissions are harmful to the environment. Oxides of nitrogen can react with water and form acids or acid rain. So I say they lead to the formation of acid rain. The next part says, an infrared spectrum of urea is shown. Refer to your data booklet. So here we have transmittance on the vertical and then wave numbers on the horizontal. They wanted us to draw a circle around the absorption spectrum that could be due to the stretching of nitrogen hydrogen. The stretching of nitrogen hydrogen based on the data booklet is going to be within this range. So we can know this peak is going to be the one corresponding to that specific stretch. So I circled this peak here. And then next they say identify the bond responsible for the absorption at 1683 per centimeter. This is going to be due to the carbon oxygen double bond stretch in urea. Part E says, in a diesel car exhaust system, the urea reacts with water to form ammonia and carbon dioxide. The enthalpy change for the reaction is positive 133 kilojoules per mole. Complete the equation for this reversible reaction. State symbols are not required. Now, because they've told us this produces ammonia and carbon dioxide, I just wrote the answers and then balanced the equation. That is what I got. So, as required. Moving on. They say sketch the reaction profile for the forward reaction on the axis provided and include labels for delta H and activation energy. So, I wrote the reactants and then the products here. We know delta H is from the level of the reactants to the level of the products. So, I put delta H, which is equal to positive 133 kilojoules per mole. Oh, by the way, you can just write reactants here instead of the actual reactants and products here. And then here you could just put delta H. Now, activation energy is from the reactant level to the highest peak on the curve. So this is my EA. And that was the answer as required. Down here they say in part F, the catalytic converter contains metal oxides. When the exhaust gases pass through the catalytic converter, ammonia reacts with oxides of nitrogen gases to form nitrogen and water. Explain why it is not correct to state that urea is acting as a catalyst in the reaction. A catalyst should not be converted into a new product that leaves the catalytic converter. In this case, we see urea is going to react. It's going to be converted into a new product, which is ammonia. And then that ammonia will react to form nitrogen, which leaves the catalytic converter. So in that case, we could say urea was not a catalyst. As I said, because urea reacts in the catalytic converter to form a new product, which is ammonia, this formed ammonia then reacts and forms nitrogen that leaves the catalytic converter. Moving on. Here they say, explain how a catalyst increases the rate of a chemical reaction. They wanted to use the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shown and refer to the collision theory. The uncatalyzed reaction has a higher activation energy than the catalyzed reaction, so I drew the activation energy lower, and as we can see, the area under the curve corresponds to the number of particles with energy. So with the uncatalyzed reaction, we see there are fewer particles because the area under the curve will be smaller. But with the catalyzed reaction, we see there is going to be more particles because the area under the curve is going to be more. So I said, 
the catalyst creates a new pathway with lower activation energy, and the fraction of molecules with energy equal to or greater than the activation energy increases, so the number of successful collisions per time also increases. And that means there is going to be a higher rate. And again, successful collisions per time corresponds to rate. In part C, they say the catalytic converter works best at a temperature of around 350 degrees Celsius. Suggest how the catalytic converter reaches this temperature. Now, remember there is an engine and the engine is heating the fuel. Hot gases leave the engine and they're going to be hot as they reach the catalytic converter. So I said hot gases from the engine heat up the catalytic converter. And next they say the chemical reactions in the exhaust system of our diesel car using a catalytic converter form 89.3 meters cubed of nitrogen per hour. They want us to calculate the number of molecules of nitrogen formed per hour. They've given us the molar volume at that temperature as that. And then they've given us Avogadro's constant. So I said molar volume given to us was that, but the volume of nitrogen per hour was 89.3 meters cubed. I wanted to first convert this to decimeters cubed because the other components given to me were in decimeters cubed. So we know one meter is 10 decimeters and one meter cubed is a thousand decimeters cubed. So I'm going to multiply this by 10 power 3, which is actually a thousand to create that in decimeters cubed. Now I can use the molar gas volume, but at this temperature, we know the number of moles is going to be volume of gas divided by molar volume. But at this temperature, they've given us that. So, so the number of moles is going to be that volume of gas divided by the molar gas volume, which is 51.1 decimeter cube per mole. My answer was 1747.6 moles. And finally, to find the number of molecules, it's going to be the number of moles times Avogadro's number, which gave me 1.05 times 10 power 27 molecules. So this brings us to the end of question 24, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.